One of the interesting things about martial arts is that the more you train, the more you develop your movement and it becomes part of who you are at kind of a cellular level, you do things more and more instinctually. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 169. Thanks for coming by. Today, we get to hear from Sensei Damien Lupo, a longtime Aikido practitioner, author, and the founder of a very interesting martial practice. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice each week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you giving us a try. You can find the show notes for this episode at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which is also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick, upcoming show guests, and even gives you some discounts on our products. Don't worry, we send two, maybe three episodes per month. We're not going to spam you like everybody else that asks for your email address does. Promise. Did you know we sponsored the website martialartsmemes.com? Whenever we find a great martial art meme or someone sends one to us, we post it at our martial arts memes website. Check it out, have a laugh, and don't forget to send us any that we're missing. It's funny how things happen sometimes. I was practicing some self-defense with a friend a couple months back, and we got to talking about yoga. Our conversation steered towards the similarities between martial arts and yoga and the synergy that existed between the two. He mentioned someone who had fused them, a martial arts and yoga hybrid. I really didn't know anything about it, but just a short time later, completely by coincidence, I was speaking with the very man he spoke of, Sensei Damien Lupo. It's a great conversation and one I really enjoyed, so I hope you'll help me welcome him to the show. Sensei Lupo. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. I appreciate it. You're, I'm sure you are having much better weather out where you are than what we've got going on here. It's, it's that, that, coming that, down that, fast and furious here in Vermont. You know, it's funny. I'm actually hoping for something to come fast and furious because I'm, I'm in Telluride for the last few days of my oh. month-long <laughs> trip here, and I'm wishing for the big storm to pile on before I take off. Well, you are welcome to have what we have right now. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. If it did, you know, I'm sure my friends would have me shipping them snow. <laughs> That'd be a great business, wouldn't it? To ship snow. Mm. But yeah, that's fantasy land. Let's talk about reality. Let's talk about what's really going on. Now, of course, we have you here to talk about martial arts. It's martial arts radio. We talk about martial arts. You know, really no secret there. But we need context. We always start out in kind of the same way because it helps us understand the rest of what we're going to talk about today. How did you get started in the martial arts? I think I probably watched a movie or or a hundred movies that had some somebody doing some type of karate or some Chuck Norris or something back when I was a kid, and I, I tested a couple of of things. I went to a karate studio when I was in early in high school, and then tried out some Taekwondo in college, and they didn't really fit. I still had this this bug that I wanted I wanted martial arts in my life. It, it, it was kind of calling me, but I wasn't sure what the style was, and and ultimately I, I checked out a studio or a, a dojo in in Arizona uh, in the end of 2000. And I remember walking in there and just checking it out, seeing what, what Aikido was all about. And when I did that, I was absolutely mesmerized. And I walked up to the sensei that, that was teaching and I said, do you do private classes? And he looked at me and he said, why don't you see if you last a month? And I just started, I kind of laughed and went, no, 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 I'm serious. Like I am, I'm in, I'm all in. He goes, you haven't even started yet. And I said, I know, but I'm ready. So that's kind of how I started. So, so what was it? I mean, you know, everybody, I think just about everybody wants to try martial arts at some point. And we all, you know, we've heard those statistics. One out of a hundred gets a black belt. One out of every hundred black belts gets their second degree black belt. You know, there's a lot of attrition, but you tried twice and you knew you still wanted it, but you hadn't found what you wanted. Yeah. So something when I, when I saw, I did the other ones there, there's a huge difference between the Taekwondo karate and then Aikido. And, and then there's different versions of Aikido, but the, the Aikido is, is very defensive. There's a different flow and my nature for what it's worth is not, it's not aggressive there. It's, there's something in me that saw the dance and saw the flow around how things were, were working almost, it, it almost looked choreographed. 
like a, a movie, the way that these, these people were moving around each other and using their energy to kind of throw them around. And it, it just resonated with me, which is why I went up to him. And I don't know that he took me very seriously that first day. But when I said I'm in, and that's kind of my personality, if I'm in on something, you better look out because I'm going all the way to wherever it is. And it just, at a soul level, it matched. I didn't, I felt like with the karate in high school, I probably was going there and it was almost forced. And I think that probably happens with a lot of kids with parents that are taking them and they're just, they're going through the motions. And I, I would have been very grateful if my parents forced me to do it and stick with it. But when I went to Aikido, it quickly became maybe the most important thing in my life that I knew I was going to be involved with forever, uh, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm sure as we get going more, we're going to be able to pick up some bits and pieces of what really it was about Aikido that resonated for you. Now here on martial arts radio, it's stories. I mean, we tell everything through stories, you know, all the lessons, all the, all the good stuff because martial arts, martial artists have the best stories. That was my whole reason for starting this show. Just cause I want an excuse to hear everybody's great stories. And here we are now a hundred and something episodes later, and I've got the best job in the world. So I'm going to ask you, What's your best martial arts story? There were a couple that, that come to mind with, uh, with that question. The, the, one of the funniest ones was when I, I was probably in, probably two or three years into training. And w one of the interesting things about martial arts is that the more you train, the more you develop your, your movement and it becomes part of who you are at kind of a cellular level – you do things more and more instinctually. And in, in the beginning, as we know, it's, it's very mechanical. And, and so a few years in things, I was, I was starting to move without thinking through. It was just, it was, it was a natural response, like walking. And I, a buddy of mine and I were at this party. I remember sitting, standing in the living room and he walked up near me and I, I think he put his hand out like kind of really quickly towards the side of my face to point at something. And I just, I naturally moved offline and threw him across the living room and people kind of looked over and, and, and I felt a little bit silly that I just thrown my buddy across the, the living room. And at the same time, I had this stupid Cheshire grin on my face thinking, wow, this stuff has actually become a part of me. I'm doing it without thinking about it. And it gave me this, this feeling like I could, I could probably walk anywhere in the world and have a different, a, a different, um, feeling of, of confidence just with that one experience, it showed me that things had become a part of me and I didn't have to go out there and, and be concerned about what I was going to do in the event that I actually needed martial arts. It just, it, 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 the feeling of it becoming a part of me was, was starting to show up. And that was one of the coolest experiences ever. You know, and not everybody gets to experience that. I've been lucky. I've experienced it two, maybe three times in my life where something just happens and it's complete instinct you know, I think in Japanese, the best term is Satori. You know, if, I'm assuming you're familiar with that term. Yes. As in Akiroka. But it's magical, isn't it? I mean, it just, it's, it could be addictive, I think is how I look at it. Yeah, I can definitely, I can definitely see that. And there, it is magical. And it's not something that happens overnight. It's something that you're almost rewiring yourself. And it's like genetic manipulation with this spiritual essence that enters into you. And, and you, you elevate to a different level of awareness. It's really, I think it's part that and part you end up becoming more and more grounded the more you train and not just the hours that you train, but the intention that you train with. And, and the more you, you become present with your, your space, whether it's the dojo or elsewhere, the more you learn that, the more you become that, I think the magic starts to become a part of your daily routine, um, as the years go by. It, that's my experience. And I think it's one of the coolest things. It's one of the reasons that it's, it's so wonderful to commit to martial arts and not just going through motions, but really committing to being a martial artist. I really like that terminology you use rewiring yourself. And I think that that's something that is pretty apt. I mean, we're, we're at a point now scientifically where we're seeing that meditation can actually restructure the brain. I mean, we can see those physical differences in scans. And I don't think anybody's done any long-term studies on the effect of martial arts on the brain. If, if they have, you know, whether if you can correct me or listeners, if somebody out there can point me to something, I'd love to see it. Heck, someday I'd love to commission it if it's not out there. But I think that any of us that have been training for a while knows that, yeah, martial arts will physically change you, mentally change you. 
over time. It, it does. That, that reminds me of the book, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Dougal. And there's there's so much in martial arts that is really inside that book and his teaching. And, and I love the idea of of this study. What Because I've never seen anything like that in terms of the what what happens with the rewiring when you are training and and going deep into it and yet it's definitely happening and there's an awareness now more than ever about this idea that we can rewire and change our brains and really martial arts may be one of the most powerful places to do it especially when you're bringing in things like the meditation and the breath work when you can rewire yourself with with the right type of breath work it's amazing it truly is and i think it's why I've dedicated so much of my life to it. You've done it. Why we've had so many others on the show that have done it and, you know, countless others out there listening and those that we aren't even talking to and may not ever get to talk to. Right. Now, you've got a lot going on. You know, I know a little bit about what you've got going on on the back end. And I know martial arts is really a big passion for you. But do you have any other interests or hobbies, anything else that you would say, you know, you really enjoy, even if it's not as much as martial arts? The, the, the interesting thing is that the things that I really enjoy, there's an alignment with the martial arts, especially the my particular form with, with the Aikido. And it's it's things there tends to be a lot of flow in. So like I love to ski. I'm, I'm here in Telluride skiing and I love yoga and I love scuba. And there's there's a gentleness around all those unless you're skiing through the trees, which I don't tend to do. But I did notice that when, when I was cruising down and I haven't been on skis in 25 years. So it's really kind of interesting to go out there this last month and noticing my body and how I'm adapting and, and how I'm keeping my balance and how the martial arts, all that training, not just the core strength, but just the awareness and how I'm able to keep the balance and not break things going down the hill. If I didn't have the martial arts, I'm pretty sure I'd be sitting here with two casts on each leg. It's just, it, it really has lent itself to everything in my life being easier, better, less conflict, more likely that I'm going to move through it without running into things. And, and it, whether that's those physical activities or even the conversations and, and one of the conversations that I love, and it's kind of a hobby is all this exponential thinking and, and the technologies that are changing. And we were talking about rewiring the brain and I love just being in that space, investigating those things. And then kind of bringing that into the dojo and and mixing these things up, because for me, the dojo is sort of like a Petri dish for the world and what I'm going to go out and and bring to the world, both by changing myself and and with my students. And, and just it's they all are it's all a kind of the same thing, just meshed in different forms um, back and forth. So pretty much anything I do is in alignment with the training. And if, if it's not in alignment with the training and the style and and the the flow with, with Aikido then I probably don't stay in it very long because it really is who I am. So there's there's a, a very clear separation between the things that I'm going to spend time with, the people I'm going to spend time with. Are they, is there a flow about them or is there a lot of conflict? I'm probably not going to spend time if there's conflict. That ha So when it comes down to it, I feel like I am Aikido in, in my heart and my mind. And so that's there, every, everything really aligns with that. I totally get where you're coming from. Makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to guess that a lot of people out there, whether or not they've realized it consciously as you have, are doing the same sort of thing. You know, the the actual physical expressions of that might be a little different. But I think a lot of us as we evolve as martial artists become less tolerant of outside chaos. I totally agree with that. It is It is fascinating how we... It, it just doesn't, it's, it, 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 there's a repelling, it's like a North on North magnet. Mm. We don't, it doesn't getting it coming, having it come close to us. It's, it's so unnatural and awkward when you go deeper and deeper into this space that it wouldn't make any sense. It would it'd be like living underwater. It doesn't work. You, you know, it's, it's not life sustaining. So we start doing that naturally, which is very cool. Yeah. And I've got to ask, so first time on skis in 25 years, how'd you do? I only somersaulted a couple of times and that was really because I was trying to find a way home after all the lifts closed and I ended up going down a mogul run and I was sort of the laughing stock. A friend of mine was over here on, on her snowboard and it's a lot easier to go on a snowboard down really weird terrain because you can kind of slide with skis. I didn't know what I was doing and so my head went down and then my skis kind of flew over me and then I got stuck. Other than that though, it was a lot better experience than I remember in the past 
And I really, really feel like all of the training and learning how to push energy down and anchor down and being more aware of my surroundings and not being hyper about going somewhere, but being really present in where I, wherever I am kept me from seriously breaking things. I mean, it was a, it was a lot more fun than I anticipated. I was a little nervous coming out here. Mm. Yeah. I, I was expecting an answer kind of like that. I, you know, just the body awareness, the, the physical awareness, the concept that, you know, you, you have a lot more control over what's going on with your relationship to your environment than a lot of people would think. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's almost like you become an extension the, the environment becomes an extension of you and you're, you're, you're deeply connected to it. It's not like you're, you, you're less in at odds or in opposition to it. It's, it's something that you move with and it kind of, it's, it's a strange connection, but the awareness it, it's, I often talk about the law of awareness versus the law of attraction, because the more aware we are, the more we sort of lose where we are. We, we, we are so connected. There's, there's less and less separation. There's no clear separation because we come, we become at one with everything. Mm. We've heard a number of stories. We're, we're getting a picture of who you are, and you sound like a pretty positive person. You sound like someone who you know things tend to go well for because you create that sort of environment for yourself. But that's not the way life goes indefinitely. So I'm sure you got some rocky stuff to reflect back on. I'd like you to think of a time where things were rocky. Tell us how you got through it and how your martial arts training helped. There was a point back in the mid 2000s where I, I I had been training for about five years and I things were going really well in business. I was making a ton of money and, and feeling pretty proud of myself. My ego was getting way too big for any type of reasonable martial artist. And I, I veered out away from training and ended up melting down my life, lost many, many millions of dollars and really kind of lost my se sense of identity and, and value. And and it, it was a big reset period. And over the next few years, I was I was pretty much wandering around lost. And it was during that time that I, I didn't really have the anchor or the grounding in, in any type of training. I trained a little bit, but almost not non-existent for about four or five years. And I remember when I finally asked the question to really figure out how to fix me, I asked the question what was true. And I realized I'd been lying to myself a lot. And and I think in large part that happened because I veered away from something that was so true, which was my training. And I went back and was able to find a place to train in Austin. And it was it was kind of ironic because I went to work on my mind with a, a, a guy named Frank Allen, who was a, a therapist that I was referred to. And I remember sitting down in his office and looking out, look, just looking around. And I saw these different martial arts certificates. And I go, oh, you you you're an Akidoka. You're you train. He said, yeah. Well, I didn't realize that was the second martial art that he'd done. He was at the time a seventh degree black belt and in uh, Kaji, uh, Kaji Kembo. And I thought that is so cool. Like this guy is going to get me and maybe I have a chance of, of figuring out what's wrong. And it, it took about, I would say about eight months where he was talking about martial arts and, and it would be inter intertangled into our conversation. And I just, I had this like yearning. I wanted to go train and I said, if there's ever a chance where I could go train or there's a, or an event or something, I would love to go train. I just, the energy is so good. And he goes, yeah, why don't you come out to the garage? So I, I met up with a few of the guys that were out there that were, were all black belts and, and it, it's it kind of started to vibe and we veered away from, he actually fired me as a, as a uh, client. He said, you're done with this. And it really felt like my, my time was to move into the martial arts for the therapy or the rewiring or just the regrounding work that I needed to do. And we found a deeper and deeper truth in that experience. And it was just this magical transition into that training. And, and that's how I moved through this, this whole chaotic mess. I found myself again in the training and I realized that the missing piece in my life that really probably accelerated the departure into off the cliff was the lack of grounding that was always there when I was training. Because when I'm training, it's and I'm at the dojo, I am fully present. I'm I'm there, and I had missed that, and so I my ego took over, which is incredibly dangerous when you have a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm about doing things. Yeah, I'm not surprised that someone coming out of Aikido would speak about grounding the way that you do. I mean, certainly it's it's kind of the foundation. It's the foundation for all martial arts, but just my experience, it's something that 
is spoken of in Aikido a little more than some other arts. Yeah, and w- one of the evolutions with um, with my my particular style and and how I move, there's the grounding is. I think that that's probably the most important thing to be grounded. If you're not grounded, I mean, period, you're just you could be all over the place. It's like flight of the bumblebee. The the other piece that has been something I've been teasing out for a number of years is the tension, and and it's really reflective of life. The more tension we have out there, the more. The, the, the more our bodies are locked up and there's less flow in general. And a big thing that I focus on with my students is constantly letting go of the tension. So we do a lot of grabbing and holding and things. And I'm always challenging people to let go of the tension be, and to be conscious of it is, is a big part of that. Just to understand and be with your body and realize that the tension is causing you to lose control because things will influence you in a different way than if you let go you really can feel things and move more gracefully and effortlessly than if you're all wound up and you've got things locked up just because you're tense and, and, and you're not totally present. I'm sure you've had the chance. I mean, we, we heard a little bit about some people that you've had the chance to train with, to learn from over the course of your martial arts career. But if you were to think of one that was the most influential, the one that really I don't want to say set you on the path because for most of us, that's our first instructor, but the Mm -hmm. person that, you know, when you think of sort of a parental figure, the person who guided you the most, the one that you look at your approach to martial arts and say, I've taken the most from this one person, or maybe it's a couple people who would those, who would that person or those people be? I think it's a combination. Um, it clearly the, the first instructor, Brian Vickery out in Arizona was, was that guy? I was his first black belt, and he he spent time with me for uh, four four years, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. And so that was that's the the anchor. And then the work I did with Frank uh, in in Texas pushed it to a different level because there was a challenge, and it wasn't. I was able to come into my own in that space and really be able to show up authentically with my own style. It wasn't just going through somebody else's motions or, or their style, I started to develop something in me that was very, very different. And, and he pushed and he challenged and he pushed back. So it wasn't always easy. There were times where I wanted to do my thing and he wanted to do his. And, and so there was a dance around that. And, and it really, it, it allowed me to answer the question of who I am and, and what my style was based on who I am. It wasn't just what I'd learned off of a, a, a sheet of techniques or somebody else's philosophy, it, it allowed me to develop my, my true voice. And there, there was one other guy that I, I went to high school with up in Alaska named Jody Trantham. And he'd been, I, I don't even remember when he started, he's been probably doing martial arts for about 30 years and, and he's in his thirties and he's just, he is the gentlest human being I may have ever met. And he's one of the most deadly and it's just, it's a fascinating combination. And I, I find this th- with most martial artists that the more advanced they get, the more, the, the gentler they often are. And I, I see this guy and you'd think, wow, are, are you a humanitarian? And yet when you see him do his martial arts and he does a lot of mixed martial art training and he, he teaches and he had a lot of the guys that are on TV, he's, he's their, their trainer. And I, there, it just it was a great example of someone just just speaking with him, understanding that you can be wickedly talented and, and incredibly uh, dangerous, so to speak, with with te- with your, the techniques and the training, and yet you can be incredibly gentle and show up soft and without an edge. And he was he's just a great example of that. And so I I look at him and and I appreciate that. And and a, a part of me wants to mimic and and model after that because it's it's such a beautiful beautiful example of of training and developing and then not letting the ego take over and and he definitely has nothing to prove and it's it's wonderful to be around him his presence is it's it's a gift i don't know that i've ever thought of that inverse relationship that you spoke of the more deadly someone is the more gentle they are but as i'm i'm thinking i'm thinking of people in particular yeah, I I see that and I'm sure a lot of it as you said has to do with the ego and I think too the realization that force begets force. Mhm. You know, I mean that's that's a principle that's taught in 
almost all martial arts as far as I'm aware. And we can just kind of let stuff happen and go with the flow and you're going to end up in the same place, but with less fighting the current. Yeah, that that's, it's, it's a great point. And it, it reminds me of, of a book that uh, some, some of the folks listening may have heard of called power versus force and, and how the, the more someone trains, the, the more they become their art, there is this deeper and deeper power, which is the, the whole deadly or the, 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 the warrior that's there. And yet they don't have to have any force because they're being, it's like somebody that is, that's been training. That's really, that embodies something. There's one guy in Austin, that's a 10th degree black belt and he walks into a room and it's like, he's pushing through with the power of his, of his energy. It's so powerful. And he's this super, he's like the, this giant bear that just, he smiles and he's happy and joyous. And yet very few people on the planet are as, as dangerous as this guy, if he were to execute his skill set, And so it's, I, that it's, it's just, it's an amazing thing to realize the difference between power and force. It's like the, I think it was a Patrick Swayze movie roadhouse where one of the characters said, I, you know, somebody that's, I think it was Patrick Swayze said that somebody that comes in looking for a fight usually isn't much of a problem. It's, it's when you go and, and somebody is trying to attack someone that is gentle that's where you unleash this, this beast. And so somebody that's out there looking for a fight, it's usually not that big of a deal. And the reality is most of us that train are going to be able to avoid that anyway, because we don't train to go out there and, and pick a fight. We, it's a, it's the opposite of what, what a lot of people think when they think of martial arts and martial arts, get, mar, martial artists get this. The more they train, we, we know that we train for something deeper and more profound than to prove it to anybody else. Totally agree. You've had the chance to, you know, tell us about who you have worked with. How about who you haven't? If you had the opportunity to, you know, roll back time or travel around the world, you know, whoever you want it to be, alive or dead, who would you want to work out with? There's a guy that wrote a couple of books uh, by the name of George Leonard, and he, I, I read his book Mastery, and I read his book. Aikido uh, or the art of Aikido. I forget what the rest of the title was. And I was, I was down in Argentina and I'm reading these books. And at the time it it was resonating with me. And I, and I realized he lived in Mill Valley in California and I got all excited and I thought, wait, you know what? I've heard great things about Mill Valley. And on this trip, I started planning a move to go over there because I just wanted to be around him and learn from him and study. And then I found out he was dead and it just, it kind of crushed me because I was ready to move. And I didn't realize it when I was reading the books and I just, I loved everything that he represented. And he started later in life. He didn't, he didn't start off as a child or anything. And he, he embodied the, the lifelong pursuit of mastery and his book mastery is so applicable to martial artists and non-martial artists alike. I loved the, how he resonated and how his book resonated. It was who he was, was something very, very special and powerful and I would, I would love to train with him. I kind of feel like when I read his stuff and I train, he's almost there. There's, there's this influence that does it. I feel like I am training with him in a way because he, he left behind these artifacts and this legacy so that it's, it wasn't a missing experience to be able to be with him. I'm able to do that in a different way. Awesome. How about competition for, for just about every martial artist competition is something that they feel strongly about one way or the other. How about you? I think the closest thing to competition is, is Randori for, for me, just the, the multiple man chaotic attack. And, and the, the first time there was ever really an experience of doing this scared the heck out of me. I was, it was part of my, my showdown, my black belt test. And, and I, I remember doing it and I was tense. The other problem was I forgot to breathe. So I almost passed out after about 45 seconds. <laughs> and so I, my sensei Brian was just laughing at me. I'm laying on the ground and, and he looked over and, and he smiled and, and then we were debriefing and he said, that was really great. And there's one thing I want to share with everybody that is breathing is good. And I'm, I'm over there laughing and get catching my breath. That was the closest thing to competition for me because with, with Aikido, it's, it, it's the art of peace. There's this, it's all about blending and, and working with somebody else's energy. So there wasn't really a, uh, a competition, so to speak. The thing that I've found in, in recent years is that I absolutely love going into that space where 
there's all this chaotic flying arms and legs and people. And, and, and that for me is, is kind of a competition. It's a competition, me with myself to figure out how loose and how present I can be to where I can basically disappear and go invisible. And so it's a different version of competition. And I used to be afraid of it. Now I want to do it all the time. And I, I get, that was one of the things I got pushed back from Frank when I said, Hey, let's do Randori again. And he goes, I don't want to do this every time. And for me, that was just me challenging myself to, to go deeper, deeper into, into the ether, just to like to, to disappear. So that's, that's my favorite version of competition. Uh, it's, it, and what's, it's what resonates with me. Now I may be wrong. I may be connecting dots here that don't really exist, but you talked a little bit about your professional life and some success you had. And as an entrepreneur, a multi-time entrepreneur, I, I know a lot about that mindset and granted, you know, every entrepreneur is not the same, but we all come from a, a we still a little bit of a shared crazy. And your talk about Randori there, is there something in you that enjoys bring bringing order to that chaos? Wow. You, 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 yeah, you nailed it. I mean, that is every day I'm thinking about how do I simplify things that are complex? How do I take this, this chaotic mess and organize it so that it's, it's smooth and flows and there's, and taking the conflict out of it. So yeah, they are one in the same. It's, that's, that's pretty amazing, but it's totally <laughs> accurate. <laughs> well, it, and I think the only reason that I'm able to articulate that is because I see it in myself. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've long said that I am a very creative person but I don't have much of an outlet. Yes, martial arts and and business, but it's because I like using my figurative brush to paint things in a way that flows. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, beyond Legos, I really wasn't a, ever artistic with anything else. I mean, God love her. My mother saved everything I brought home from art class, but it it really wasn't worth saving. <laughs> I know that one. I don't know what my mom did that, but she did the same thing. I think I think it's a parental thing, you know. We we yeah. love we love what kids create even if it's lovable only because our kids created it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. I, and you're that's a good description the way that I look at at business and my professional life. To me there's there's this canvas that that's out there that's that's been created uh or or that I use when when I'm doing business where I'm creating a, a new, um, doing a new, new investment or, or whatever I'm doing, it's how I, it's how my art shows up. And because I can't paint to save my life, I can't really do anything other than maybe like Legos or Lincoln logs, kind of my, th my thing as a kid. Now that's how I, I, f I bring that to the world because I think really one of the most powerful things for any of us is to find our art and to become an artist. It's not to be robotic and doing some type of manual thing over and over. There's an inner genius in us and it gets influenced by all sorts of things with, with the martial arts, because I'm, I'm so devoted to finding ways to create flow and, and release tension and pain and conflict. When I'm, when I'm doing business, there's a, there's a natural tendency to find ways to work with people and their energy to remove the conflict and, and when I've done financial consulting and, and coaching and things, I'm constantly challenging people to find the pieces that are creating the conflict and let them go and, and be in a place where there's this ease and flow. And I, I, a lot of times people are so, they're so well-versed and they have so much experience with so much conflict. They don't even know what it's like to actually move effortlessly and with flow. And that I, once they start to experience it, it's, it's this magic of, wow, there doesn't have to be pain every day. And, and it's a beautiful thing when, when you can let go of the pain in, in, the, in the financial and the money world. And it really, it's an influence, to, I think, from all of the martial arts training and just becoming that. You, you don't want to see the conflict. The conflict is, it's unnecessary and yet it's so common. We think it's normal. And I, I just don't think it is. I think we can live a life without that conflict most of the time. Yeah. I don't talk a lot about my prior career on this show. Longtime listeners will, will know that, you know, I, I was in IT. I had a small IT consulting firm and I tried to structure every business arrangement I had, every relationship so that everybody was on the same side of the table. My employees, for example, the vast majority of them were not paid based on, you know, an hourly wage or a salary, but their productivity. So my job became make sure they have enough work. 
I didn't have to micromanage them. I didn't have to, you know, try and get as much out of them as possible while they're resistant to that, trying to do as little as possible, which is, you know, it's human nature. So some of them wanted to work really hard and they made me more money and they made themselves more money. And anytime I had any relationship, any contract, I would make that effort to, to structure things so that we were able to support each other in that success. That's a perfect dance. It's, it's a beautiful dance when you, when you're conscious around it and it's, it's not just the, the natural knee jerk reaction that, that oftentimes happens in business, but really being in relationship with the people on your team, the people that you're working, doing business with that, that relationship has everything to do with deep fulfillment. And, and that's a huge difference between the success of winning or the success of making money, the fulfillment of the relationship lends itself to creating all those successes as a byproduct. So what you described is a beautiful creation of those relationships. Yeah. And as Whistlekick grows, I found myself avoiding any business relationship where it's almost adversarial, where one side wins at the expense of the other. Yes. It's not worth it. No, it's not. And it's, it, it becomes a, a non-negotiable idea to even entertain that. And and what I found for myself is that as I, as time goes on, if I make a mistake and, and, and am in a, some type of business arrangement or relationship with someone where there's that adversarial uh, thing that's happening, I tend to find a very, very quick way to disengage and unleash that thing because it is toxic to all parties. And, and I, I'm not going to stay in something being conscious to it that's detrimental to, to living. So it's, once you're there, it, it, it's interesting how you will re repel it and and release things, and you won't feel bad about it. Like you won't stay in things for years. You'll absolutely say, "No, this is who I am, and and here's what's okay." And it's it's a very powerful confidence uh, space. And you can apply that concept to anything: your martial arts training, romantic relationships, friendships, business relationships, uh, financial investments. I mean, it's. It is a concept that I think is very simple, but it's not easy to implement. That's exactly right. It is It is absolutely a simple concept. And it's very rare that somebody couldn't understand that. But implementing it, especially when we have the muscle memory of doing things differently and and wanting to maybe not hurt people's feelings or going to win, ver it's a, a win versus lose versus creating something fair and being on the same side of the, of the table, like you described, you really have to practice it. It's not, I, I think society is, is really set up in a different way for, for what we, we learn as, as kids and, and what we see out there. It's very adversarial and it's very, it, there's a lot of conflict and we get so used to it. You really have to decide that, that, that there's something different, more important that you want to be and, and how you want to live and, and who you're going to be engaged with. And then you can start practicing it and then it just becomes normal. Yeah. You know, what is the symbol that we use in the martial arts more than any other? It's the yin yang, you know, and, and granted it's not the shades of gray that I think most of us understand the world to be, but the knowledge that there is white within black, black within white, soft and hard, hard in soft. And I think that I've always interpreted that as a representation of that same notion that things are shades of gray. It is rarely the two extremes that our media and uh, Facebook postings would seem to indicate. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that, it. It's there is a an interesting dance that I've done in my mind uh, over the the last probably four or five years, thinking about the black and white, the rules, the values that that are going to drive me. And there, about a year ago, I started this business. And part of the business startup was thinking about the values that were going to drive every decision and activity and who I was and who I am. And one of the things that was that one of those six values is uh, one of them is relationship, which we've spoken about. One of them is transparency and being very, very open. So on, on my team and in the world, people know exactly where I stand. I, there is not some hidden agenda. And I have a really hard time with any version of gray in that space, because I want, it's important for me to have nothing that's manipulating a conversation 
and it, it's really hard to do because people have stuff going on in their lives. And it, unless you have 20 or 30 years to get to know everything about somebody, it's oftentimes you're going to be missing things. I, I have a hard time with, with being close to somebody, whether it's in my business or in our other relationship where there's a lack of transparency, where there's different shades of, of truth. And I was, I was talking to one of my mentors earlier today, talking to him about this very subject. And for me, it's, there's a level of truth when you are asked a question and you say what's true. And then there's a different level when you're open about what's going on or you're sharing with people before they ask you. And I have a hard time with, with people that I'm close to or in business that need me to ask them something and they won't tell me without that. To me, that feels like a version of a lie. It feels like a version of holding back and manipulation. And it's it's a gray space. And it's just one of those things where I'm constantly having to judge how hard I'm going to be on on other people and, and how they're going to show up. And what, what I do know is that people will, the way they show up one place is how they show up everywhere. And so I'm constantly watching that with, with people. And, and if there's a, a compartmentalization of how they're, what they're sharing and what they're being honest about, I tend to get nervous and I tend to tend, tend to pull back because I'm not totally sure what I'm dealing with. And I don't feel like the trust is really there. So in that case, I tend to push more towards black and white, even though it's a very strange gray space that we all live in, in terms of what we're sharing and how transparent we're being. Yeah. Yeah. I find myself that if I'm feeling like there's something I don't want to share, you know, but, but you know, we've been talking about business for most of this question, or at least that sort of context. If there's something that's coming up for me that I'm feeling like maybe this person doesn't get, they don't know, that's the thing I need to say the most. Mm -hmm. Because why waste my time? Why waste their time? Why, you know, why lie in a romantic relationship? Why waste that time? If it's not going to work, it's not going to work. Cards on the table. Maybe not all of them the first moment, but you know, keeping an ace up a sleeve. I mean, that, that goes back to the adversarial notion that we've been talking about and the fact that it doesn't exist in a healthy relationship, whatever the sphere is. That's right. Totally agree. You mentioned Roadhouse earlier. And while I don't know that I personally would classify it a martial arts film, it's come up on this show enough that I think it gets honorary <laughs> standing as a martial arts movie. Uh, right. it's a rather quotable movie. Uh, it, it just, you know, it's Patrick Swayze and, and, you know, I mean the power of that hair, I mean, you can't really deny it. He there... did have the original big hair. I mean, his hair was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just imitated, but, but never quite duplicated. You know, I, I, look at, right. I look at old photos of Bon Jovi and I think maybe that's what he was going for. Mm. <laughs> Are there other films in the martial arts sphere or even the honorary martial arts sphere that you might call your favorites? The one that pops out for me that I, I remember watching, I watched Roadhouse a lot as a kid for whatever reason. And the other one that I watched quite often was hard to kill with Steven Seagal. And I, I think it was just the first one that I watched and, and that may have been what drove me towards Aikido, just seeing how he was moving. And it was, it was different than, than maybe a Jackie Chan or a Bruce Lee type of, of style. It just seemed like there was, there was a different level of confidence where I would watch him moving in that movie. And, and I thought it doesn't seem to matter how big somebody is or how many there's just this, he's right there with him and he's moving around using pinkies or whatever. And it's, it, there was something that it, it didn't seem like physics would allow the things he was doing to happen. And, and I, 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 for, for better or worse, I, I kind of studied that movie and watched it a lot. And ultimately that I sort of went toward, I went towards the Aikido, a different version. It's, I mean, his style is extremely hard. It's, it, it's, um, pretty aggressive. I mean, I don't know that I would call that the art of peace. That's kind of the art of pain the way he does. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard it put so succinctly. I love it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can appreciate that movie that, that was, yeah, and, and most of his movies are generally terrible in terms of story or, or whatever, and they, they go straight to DVD or, or digital. But I that was that was one of those that that really that I, I just loved, and I, I wanted to watch and try to figure out how to take the pool cue and do what he did with it and move people and throw them around. And it, so that that was me. That was my, my movie as a kid. 
It's a great film, certainly. And one that if you haven't seen, you know, maybe you need to suspend your opinion of modern Steven Seagal. You know, we try to avoid the subject of, of Steven Seagal now on this show. <laughs> I uh, get it. It's, it's one that, um, well, he has friends in high places and I would like to continue doing this show. So we don't go there. But, yeah. you know, early Steven Seagal was pretty revolutionary, at least in the context of film. Totally, totally agree. I, when I think about that, too, one of the things that I, I have to um, I, I practice this consciously is being careful about judging people and and remember and not forgetting that people are fallible and they we all have our stuff. It's I, I used to do these trainings and where I would I would teach at seminars uh, for business, real estate and things. And one of the things that would happen is I would really look up to these gurus. And then once I got to know them, I'd, I'd go, wow, your life is kind of a wreck. And what I realized, and I, I had to be conscious that if I got close enough to people, I was going to see their warts. I was going to see the dark things, the things that, and I, we've all got stuff that we're, we don't necessarily love about our present or our past. And, and I can now look at somebody and, and look at the, the best of who they are and what they've brought to the world and what I can learn from them and be less judgmental around the other stuff because, Hey, I mean, there's plenty of things that I can be judged for and, and people would lose what I can bring to their life. That's good. If they just saw the the stuff that's not so good. Yeah. Now when it comes to actors is, is Seagal at the top of your list or somebody else sit in that place? I think I've probably seen him. I mean, he and, and 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 Jackie Chan. I've probably seen more than than any others. I mean, just because it was almost like this cultish following as a kid with with his movies. Um, he's probably at the top of the list in terms of influence and what I've seen the most. And and then now because of the training I've done for almost twenty years, it's I can I understand what he's doing and 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 I get it and I can do a lot of that stuff. So it's. I think that I'm more closely connected to that than I would be to Jackie Chan. I would kill myself if I attempted anything he was doing, sliding through bars and flying off roofs and things. So that's, I think I, I I'm closely connected to, to Seagal just because of the style. Yeah. You've mentioned a couple books on today's episode, and this might be a good time to remind people and let the new listeners know whistlekick martial arts radio.com. That's where we put all the show notes titles, links to things. So if you're new or maybe you're you're driving in a car and you don't want to risk bodily injury or getting arrested to jot down a website or something, you know, you can head o over there and just click links and, and copy and paste stuff. You mentioned a couple books. Are there other books that you would recommend to the listeners? You know, maybe around martial arts or, you know, some of these other kind of philosophical subjects we've talked about today the, the, so one of the things that i've i've done in in the last few years is narrowed down the number of books that i'm reading and i tend to study those and it used to be i'm going to read a, a book or two a week and i was just pumping myself full of information and i've, I've shifted to where i'm deeply diving in and, and looking for the nuggets and rereading things and that's what's happened with both power versus force and with leonard's book uh, books but especially mastery because it's there are such deep lessons there and to study it and talk about it with people, just those two books. And I mean, there's there's a whole slew of them with that, that I, I love and, and that I've touched, but I haven't gone as deep as I have with those two books. And those are probably two of my top five books, period, for all subjects that I I couldn't recommend highly enough to anyone that hasn't read those because they're so applicable for everything in our lives and definitely in the martial arts. But mastery in general is is one of those things that when we really, really get the idea behind it, we realize it kind of frees us up from having to hit something or or achieve something that being in the process and actually living and being present is the entire point. And and we're we're living in that space the more we understand mastery. So that's those are two of my absolute favorites those are great yeah it's pretty clear from the stories that you've been telling us today that you've accomplished a lot and you don't strike me as someone who tolerates barriers very well <laughs> so i'm guessing that most of the goals that you've set out for yourself you've accomplished or you're on the path to accomplishing them 
but goals tend to keep people motivated. So what are your goals now? What are you working towards? And, you know, what are you willing to tell us about them? Big picture, I've got I've got a couple of, of major goals, and they they show up with in different forms. Uh, one of one of my primary goals is to set people free from financial bondage, and so the work I do in in financial consulting and and building companies and and just that work in that field has everything to do with bringing people to a, a space of awareness. And so the the deeper I go into my training, the more I'm able to understand how to deliver those those tools and and psychologically and emotionally and spiritually help people get out of, of this, this jail that they have often created for themselves. So my goal is, is to free millions of people. I mean, as many as I can, all of them, if I can, it's, it's not one or two. And I, I think there's a power in influencing a single person with the best of who we are. And if we can influence a million with something, I think that's, it's our obligation. It's, it's not something that's optional when we can, we should, if it's the right thing. And, you know, one of the things that I've thought about for many, many years, and I don't have kids yet, but one of the, one of my goals and a, a vision I have is putting a black belt on my daughter. I just think that that'd be the most, the coolest thing. And so I'm hopeful I'll have that opportunity at some point. So that's kind of a very narrow, small, like very personal goal outside of the influence of humanity, I would love to have that inside my family and be able to share that and inspire and teach you know, my own offspring. Right on. I think that's the dream for any of us is the ability to pass that knowledge on to other people. Yes. I mean, you can't, you can't, you don't have to look very far to see a martial arts school that is losing money and has lost money for a decade. Right. Continues right. to operate and the instructor, the school owner, you know, really robs money from their other job, so to speak, to pay for that because they believe so strongly in bettering people and passing on their knowledge. And, you know, um, I applaud every one of you out there that is teaching, whether it's your full time job or a hobby or whether you're making money or not. Because if we don't pass it on, then martial arts dies and nobody listens to these shows. And, 20 years. <laughs> no, it's really not about that, but I got to break, really the, I gotta break the humor it, once in a while. I, it, it, that, that's pretty funny because I've often had these conversations with people talking about the, the dojo model and, and martial arts and, and how to set that, that up to where, especially people that are in love with it and don't want to do anything else. And they're trying to figure out how they're going to support their lifestyles. And it, usually that the dojo is, is a hobby that we pay to be a part of. It's, it's not something that, in general pays us and it, it just goes to what it is, what it's all about and how much it matters when you deeply commit to it. So I, I don't know that I could really go into a dojo space with that idea that this is going to be a business. It's, it's a way to contribute. It's a way to connect and it's a way to give to other people and lift them up. And so it, it's, it, there's a different intention behind it. So I don't, I'm not looking for, I know a lot of, a lot of times one of my conflicts with a lot of studios and things, a lot of dojos is that they tend to be focused on making sure that they're solvent, which is an admirable thing. You got to keep your lights on, but then there's just, it, it ends up being a, a, a belt mill. And when I've seen that, I, it makes me cringe. I love the space where people can dance and play and learn together. And it's so genuine and authentic and there's no push for anything other than what's real. And that's, it, it's easier said than done to take the money out of the equation. And yet when you do that, I think it often opens space for people to just be able to, to be in relationship in a deep way uh, without any type of conflict or friction around, around the financial pressures of it. For sure. We've heard you talk a little bit about your professional pursuits throughout the course of this show. And I'd like to give you a chance now to, to really focus on those, talk to us about them. You know, talk to us about what's going on with your financial coaching and, and anything else that seems appropriate to share right now. Well, the thing that I think is, is really the, the, the merger of my, my professional work and, and the martial arts and, and what I love to share. And so I've got, I've got a company that does financial services. The, the thing that's really the essence of me that I would love to have people check out and, and look at is, is both the martial art that I've, I formed, which is Yokido, and that's a blend of yoga and Aikido. 
And, and that's it. You, people can see some, some stuff about that at yokido, yokido.org. And the other one is the Black Belt Wealth. And the, the website there is web, blackbeltwealth.net. That's where I'm, I'm, I'm teaching people how to use these, these martial arts principles, especially the Aikido principles, and fusing them into money and finance and taking the conflict out of that and learning how to create abundance by being in relationship with other people and creating things together and in re- being in relationship in peace with with money and not so much conflict. So those are the two places that I would love to share with people, have them go and and check out and and then reach out to to me for anything that really resonates in either one of those spaces, any any way that I can help people. That's that's my soul. When when people see that and they they see the videos there, they they see me sharing, they're going to for some people that is going to resonate and I would I would love to hear from them. I I love hearing people that want to shift something and that, that maybe I have something I can help them with that, an awareness or or just a move that would allow them to tap into something that's waiting for them. So I'm, I'm wide open and I'm here to serve. That's great. And I don't know about you. I don't know about all the people listening, but I got to be honest. I find I do much better working in, in a non-martial arts way with other martial artists. There's just, there's something about it. There's something about that shared perspective that so many of us have that puts us on the same side of the table to, to borrow that analogy I used before. Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfect. And I totally agree with that. It's, it's an amazing place to be in relationship with people outside of the dojo that have a similar philosophy and, and ideology around the world and, and, and around how they are and how, and who they are. Great. Now, if you, had the opportunity and you do have the opportunity to share some last words, not that you're dying or anything, but we are (laughs) coming to a close here. What bits of advice would you want the listeners to know? I, I, I think any, any time we, we are especially training, there is an incredible value in being conscious around doing things versus being in something being present and for newbies or for advanced martial artists there's there's a different level that we can go to the when we we stop doing things and we we literally surrender when we lose the tension and and we're we're simply in a space and we're holding the space and the more that we practice that that's where the magic that we talked about starts to happen where you start to become something and you really have to stop doing things. I think we, we lose the ability to shift if we're tense and we're focused on impacting something or doing something. When we let go and we show up authentically, releasing the tension, all sorts of amazing magic happens. There's an energy about Sensei Lupo that had me feeling both comfortable and motivated. It's clear that he's fully embraced the personal development of martial arts and it doesn't look like he's veering from that path anytime soon. Thank you, Sensei Lupo, for your time today. Over at WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with photos, links to the things this very busy man has going on, and his excellent book recommendations. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and our username is WhistleKick. You should also check out the Facebook group, WhistleKick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. We've been posting some questions and some other great stuff in there recently getting feedback from you all. And we've got episode 200 coming and we're going to be posing some questions to you folks about what you want to see in episode 200. Where are we going to do that? The Facebook group. Just search Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. You're going to find our regular Facebook page and you're going to find our closed approval only, we'll approve you, promise, private group. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing so you don't miss any episodes. We're always asking you to help us out if you're willing Got a few ways you can do that. The best one, sharing the show with your friends. You can leave us a review over on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can join the newsletter list. You can join that Facebook group. You can like our Whistlekick overall brand page on Facebook. You can shout us out on social media. Pretty much anything that seems like it would make us feel warm and fuzzy, go ahead and do that. And I personally would be very appreciative. Don't forget to check out martialartsmemes.com. A couple good laughs over there. More than a couple. Quite a few good laughs over there. Hope you enjoy that site. I don't think that we've ever talked about it, so apologies. 
I appreciate you spending some time with us here on the show, listening to my voice as you continue to do. This show means the world to me, as you may know, and your continued listening is the reason I get to keep talking. So thanks so much. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day. You know, one of the things that's, that I'm really proud of that's a lot of fun was the when I did my third degree a few years ago, I had – um, I had a videographer come out and record everything. He had like five different cameras. It was pretty cool. Oh, sweet. And then, yeah, and then he, and then he cut it. And so I have this three minute thing for that. And it, it, it cuts out the, the moment that was like the, the big moment where I, I was doing Randori and it was three hours into this thing. And I was, I, I was cramping up in an hour. So I was yeah. a disaster, but we were doing the Randori and I'm throwing these guys around and I, flip this one dude who is a just an incredible acrobatic martial artist. I flip him. He's up in the air. I go to the next guy. And while he's upside down, his heel comes over and hits my cheek, breaks my cheek. I go down, I'm laying on the ground and I'm looking up going, what the hell just happened? And everybody's looking going, was that supposed to happen? And, and, and then I get up and I mean, we were done and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm totally fine because it, all the energy went into my cheek and didn't touch any nerves or anything. But my cheek was broken in and there was this dent like the Grand Canyon in my face. And so everybody's just staring at my face. I'm talking about something and they're, they're whispering to each other. And I'm, la I'm like, what's the deal? I look in the mirror and I go, hey, guys, I need to go to the ER because I broke my face. <laughs> so it's kind of awesome. Oh. But uh, it was brutal.